enjoy and will will be able to gather some knowledge especially we are dealing a lot uh, re regarding our own country and some others and here we have an opportunity to know something about a country which is not of our own so some foreign data and some foreign facts will also be we will be we will also be able to hear and to gather knowledge from our eminent speaker so i do welcome him and would like to announce that uh, we are going to start our session and uh, now i will hand over departmental head monidipa dattagupta madam madam you please carry on i'm sure that this session will be of a grand success thank you thank you very much ma'am the principal the madam for inaugurating our webinar and as the head of the department of anthropology of norishingo dot college it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you and also our eminent speaker dr shudeep dattoboni in today's webinar which has jointly been organized by the iqac cell of our college dr bonik is a professor and head of the department of human ecology at the center for research and advanced studies in merida mexico he is working there since 2013 previously he was a reader of anthropology at vidyasagar university in west bengal he is also a certified researcher of the mexican national council of science and technology and a fellow of human biology association usa he has done his specialization in biological anthropology and his major area of interest is to study growth and nutrition in children adolescents and adults also he has done lots of research work in the field of sports nutrition he has more than 100 scientific articles in peer reviewed journals edited four volumes and has acted as principal investigator in several projects under ugc ICSSR ICMR and also in several projects in Mexico so you see the list goes on and i therefore cut it short and hand over to our guest speaker dr shudeep dattobonik as we are all eagerly waiting for his deliberation thank you all thank you good evening to my dear friends dear students and colleagues nice to connect really uh, i'm delighted and honored to be invited here as a speaker um uh, actually i'm not a very good speaker uh, after 23 years of my teaching experience i would like to teach something to my students and discuss something it's like a discourse not actually a a seminar lecture or something like that i would like to share some information on epidemiology of covid-19 we know um many issues uh, but first of all i must uh, thank uh, to the department of anthropology of north nodot college and internal quality assurance sale of the college and uh, to the principal dr banerji uh, i appreciate very much for this uh, seminar um well uh, i think um there are many students among the attendees of this meeting so i will try to uh, present something in a rather simplified way uh as monidipa ma'am told me that uh, probably you have epidemiology in your uh, syllabus <clears throat> so to start with uh mm, what is epidemiology epidemiology is a uh, branch of medicine rather so you know but uh, now we are working uh, in this area of epidemiology from the point of view of other fields of biology and also social sciences but it's a branch of medicine that deals with any kind of uh, 
incidence, distribution, and control of any disease and its associated factors. Sometimes the infectious disease become epidemic. It means uh, when uh, uh, it's a widespread occurrence in a particular time and in a particular space. Space may be a community, um, maybe a particular region of a country or entire country. But in this case of COVID, it is not a pan, it is not an endemic, it's a pandemic. That means uh, worldwide, you know. So we know many things about uh, uh, COVID-19. Like many people say um, COVID, many people say Corona. So sometimes uh, the common people, they get confused about what is COVID, what is COVID-19 and very few people, relatively few people know about the SARS-CoV-2, you know, so we know what the severe acute respiratory um, syndrome coronavirus 2, that means the SARS-CoV-2 uh, is the virus responsible um, and that started appearance most probably in December in 2019, so almost more than uh, one year and eight, nine months, but we don't know exactly when it started. So. <clears throat> Let me uh, start my, present, uh, my presentation. Let me see where it is. Um, well, can you see the screen? Please confirm, Muniripa. Yes, it can be seen. It's okay now. Okay, thank you. So, epidemiology of COVID-19 uh, in Mexico. So, Mexico is one of the countries, very few, among the few, very few countries that um, uh, we have the open access database, the national uh, surveillance database on COVID-19. Very few countries like United States, uh, Mexico, um, and initially Italy, Spain, and some other countries they had, but. Uh, China also they had, uh, but I don't know um, how many countries uh, they have this kind of open access database. That every day, the Ministry of Health of the federal government of Mexico is updating the information, and you can find the all registered um, um, uh, cases of COVID-19 in Mexico. Of course, the real situation is more critical. It is, this is only the official cases, that is millions of cases are registered and uh, they have the age, sex and the comorbidities and the um, hospitalization, history of uh, case history and many other. So you can, you can also download uh, this, da this database in India and uh, check every day what is going on. Um, along with uh, like um, WHO, they have the dashboard. This dashboard is a very common word that we use these days. Like every country, they should have a dashboard that every each and every day they have to update their information. It is obligatory um, uh, um, to share the knowledge and information of um, this COVID-19. Um, but unfortunately, many countries, they don't share. But at least the WHO, they have some information across the world. And um, like on 2nd of July, they had more, we, globally, we had more than 182 million, more than cases, confirmed cases of COVID-19. So, and death, almost 4 million. So, unfortunately, this, and this is the scenario of, uh, at this moment uh, in July to 2021. And we can see that very popular words, we you know, the first wave, second wave, third wave, and here we can see the waves, how the waves um, uh, started in the first, in the initial stage of uh, 2020, and then um, uh, the cases um, accelerated, that is in an exponential rate, and in the end of 2020 and middle of 2021, we have this kind of situation like the waves of this COVID-19, you know. Uh, and we know that India, we have the, India and Mexico, we have a very similar situation. Uh, the, the corona, the COVID-19 situation started in 2021 when USA, Mexico, and China they had the similar trend, similar pattern. Um, and later, India joined, and now the situation in in India, we know uh, there are many reasons. 
um, uh, like at this moment, we have more than 30 million uh, cases, confirmed cases, and out of that 400,000 uh, deaths, so almost 10% of total case worldwide. So it's really very serious situation in India. But it is not only in India, everywhere in the world, the situation is very bad, like in, the, in June. In one week, we can see the global situation of uh, COVID-19 all over the world, and particularly uh, the Latin American countries. You see, uh, um, uh, that's why I think you have uh, observed Copa America uh, final and other matches, and you didn't find any spectator in the stadium. So it is prohibited. But in Europe, the situation is much better. You can see the color. That's why in Europe, our final that we have today, uh, you will find many spectators in the stadium. So the situation of COVID-19 in Latin American countries at this moment is very critical. And uh, the death also, it is the simultaneous, the, the number of confirmed cases is increasing at the time of, um, so it is beyond control. So um, like now to this presentation, I will divide, I have decided to divide this uh, because it's a very wide theme, you know, so it's very difficult to summarize. So I have noted down some points in my paper so that I cannot be distracted for in, into many issues. And then um, first of all, I would like to share some information about COVID-19 in Mexico and overview. Then a very interesting case um, uh, issue that six differences in the susceptibility to infection. Well, most of this uh, discussion of these, uh, I will concentrate on the publications from Mexico, um, mostly by our colleagues, and some of them was published by me and with my collaborators. And uh, the next um, point would be the comorbidities. And then obesity uh, as one of the major factors. Uh, I will discuss why obesity is uh, a very serious issue in, uh, as, as a part of COVID-19 in Mexico. Then um, uh, the other points like five and six. So, and the last point I will discuss about uh, the human ecology because, you know, I'm a, basically I'm an anthropologist. So I'm not an epidemiologist, but it's an epidemiological issue. But where anthropologists and other uh, researchers and other interested people, they can join their hands uh, in this research or in this understanding. So I'd like to share you some um, deep understanding about uh, the human ecological uh, issues, human ecological perspective of COVID-19. Like at present, I'm um, working in the human ecology department and being an anthropologist, um, I would like to present myself as a human ecologist. And what is the role of a human ecologist and how a human ecologist, um, what is the point of view of human ecologist to deal with uh, uh, this, um, the signs of uh, this disease, this epidemiology of disease. So, you know, <clears throat> the first case of COVID-19, most probably it was diagnosed, diagnosed in China in December um, 2019 to 2019, when almost 20 or 26 cases and one death first time. And that time, um, uh, probably WHO, they didn't have any report because this kind of virus, well, not not really very uncommon, but it is um, no one uh, could think that this kind of pandemic uh, could come out of this virus. You know, previously we had in, we have seen influenza like in early uh, 2000 and then uh, in 2009 and other cases when Mexico and other Latin American countries, the people were affected. So but not like this one, because uh, we know so now we, we we are hearing some uh, variants, genetic variants, you know, alpha, beta, delta, gamma. So what are these things? So I will share some um, basic information on these um, uh, types of um, SARS-CoV-2. And this type of virus generally causes um, uh, disease in animals and humans. And SARS-CoV-2, we don't know, actually. We don't have any concrete evidence that it has been transmitted from any other in rare or exotic animals like uh, bats. But uh, WHO mm, uh, declared this disease on in the month of March. Um, it is a pandemic. So uh, we know that uh, uh, the, this pandemic, uh, this uh, SARS-CoV-2, this COVID-19 is transmitted from humans to humans. So 
but there are some common symptoms before going that like in like dashboard in in mexico uh, that i what i was saying it is uh, sometimes it is in spanish but i have <laughs> pointed out some english because so that you can understand uh, the official language in in, Span in in mexico is spanish and moreover it is mexican spanish um, and after living here more than uh, 10 years or uh, more than 11 years because uh, as Munidipa told that I am living, uh, working here in 2013, since 2013, yes, officially, but previously I was two, two, year, two and a half years uh, on my sabbatical, on my study leave. So altogether, we are living here more than 11 years. And so now I am a little bit accustomed with this uh, language, but uh, probably most of you not. So this is the dashboard that every day the government, uh, federal government, the Ministry of Health is updating. Like in 2020, in 2020, in July, just one year back, um, we had 400,000, little more than 400,000 positive cases and almost 43,000 uh, deaths, almost the 10%, you know. So uh, so number of co um, confirmed cases and number of deaths, it was like the 10% of these uh, confirmed cases, the people were dying. Um, and almost majority of those cases, they were rec they got recovered and... Um, uh, well, of course, uh, there's a sex difference between this um, uh, this prevalence, like all more than 50%, a little less than 50% of, of the male and female, respectively, they were affected. But what is the scenario after one year? Like in July 2020, we find that death cases and positive cases, almost it was 400,000 in the last year in July. Now it has become th more than 3 million, almost 3 million cases. And confirmed cases also increased, like more than 2.5 million. And death cases also, it was like 40,000. Now we have two, more, nearly 240,000, uh, 240, 200. So it's difficult to control the situation because we will also try to explore what are the reasons behind this kind of pandemic um, in Mexico why the cases are increasing still now it is after having so much uh, so many precautions and so many measures taken by the government and non-government agencies um, uh, but cases are going every every day so <clears throat> and um, it's the same like the male female the uh, difference it is almost like um, uh, males are more affected so it is the difference between the uh, between 200 2020 and 2021 we can see that almost uh, 10 times it has increased the uh, uh, cases, you know. So, and in Mexico, it's very common that we use uh, this kind of, uh, in Spanish, it's called semaphore. That means the traffic light, you know, is, is there, there is one additional color is orange. That means um, every, we have 32 states in Mexico. So in 32 states at this moment in July, um, some more majority of the states, we have the green um, light. Uh, that means that people can um, go out and for walk, but they should maintain um, uh, some precautionary measures to take, like they, they should wear masks and use the sanitizers, etc., etc. It is not that uh, that you are vaccinated, so you don't need to wear mask because the variants, the genetic variants, are changing. Of course, it is uh, like in, in, the, in, the, in the United States and in some countries of Europe, it is recommended that not to use uh, masks when all people get vaccinated. But um, it is good because you don't know uh, the people who are not yet vaccinated and mostly the young people, the children, they are not vaccinated. So they may be get affected. So this way, uh, the country, the Mexico, the federal government of uh, Mexico, um, they control, uh, they are trying to control the situation. And the geographical location you see is very important, uh, very interesting. Um, just below the United States, and it is a connecting, it's a corridor between the North America and the Latin America. So Mexico is a part of North America with Alaska, uh, uh, Canada, United States, and Mexico, the four countries. Canada, United States, and Mexico, uh, but it's a corridor like people from uh, South America, uh, they move and um, the, uh, all the airports are open. So these are the major drawbacks that in, uh, due to its geographical location, uh, Mexican government cannot close the border. Um, uh, the, the airports are open. Never we had the, uh, the, the closed 
uh, corridors like the op uh, airports and so so people were coming from Europe, people were coming from the United States because the medical uh, health facilities are very good and um, health delivery system is very good in Mexico. Doctors, uh, the physicians are very good, very, like Cuba. So, uh, and of course, rel relatively uh, reasonable uh, cost of treatment. So people from different countries in Europe, since Mexico was a um, colony of Spain, and here are people from um, Spain, Italy, uh, France um, and many other European countries they live. So uh, I will I will show that how uh, it started the endemic uh, pandemic in 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 Mexico. Likewise, in the United States in in 2020, like in July 2020. So it was uh, like uh, all in July 2020 it was almost four million, and now in July 2021 it's just 34 million. So. As I told before, that United States, Mexico, and China initially in the uh, in the first phase of uh, uh, COVID-19, uh, the, the takeoff was the similar, was almost similar. In uh, the the exponential rate of increase of the cases were almost similar. The pattern was almost similar. Like you see, um, the in, in from January, February uh, to March, the Mexico and United States had the same trend. Well, these data were, were published in a paper um, in 2020. Uh, it is an open access journal uh, from India, of course, uh, Journal of Life Science. You can access to this paper and you can find all this information. That initial uh, data, how uh, the COVID-19 started in Mexico and also in Europe and many other countries. The real, the actual situation right now and we can see that how the, here we can also see the waves, you know, so the, in 2020 and mm, in January 2021, the cases, number of new cases per day increased uh, huge in Mexico. So why? Um, well, of course, the climate is an, was another factor mm, and, uh, you know, festive season. So um, uh, the environmental issues, social cultural issues, um, of course, some political connections uh, like elections had, we had elections here also in, in Mexico. So altogether, um, the gathering of people um, during this festival season, like in January, November, December, January, it was huge. So of course, these are the impacts, the negative impacts and the number of cases increased. But at this moment, there is a downtrend, there is a going down again, but still it is rising so we don't know where uh, and when we will uh, stop this pandemic so almost this the, in this way the accumulated confirmed cases reached more than 2.5 million cases and here is an interesting issue that male and female almost 50 percent but previously more males were getting affected now little more um, percentage of uh, female, like the 51% of female and 49% of males are getting affected. Why? We'll try to explore later. So um, this, these are the variants, you know, that we know very famous, the alpha, beta, delta, gamma, but there are many other variants. Um, the molecular biologists and other scientists, they say that there are many variants, but we have, we can divide the genetic variants into in two groups like uh, variants of concern and variants of in variants of interest so these are the variants of concern that's a major that's get, you know, the people are getting affected like alpha from united kingdom uh, probably we don't know exactly but it is established at this moment that alpha variant is from the united kingdom its origin beta from south africa delta from india and gamma from brazil and almost all countries, this is a situation when yes or no, it is ex um, existing these variants in these countries or not. So um, like in Mexico. So we can see that alpha, delta and gamma, these three variants and the Indian origin delta variant, it is um, at this moment, the February, March, April, at this moment, uh, the last six months, um, the Delta variants uh, was very high in Mexico and you know, uh, so right now there is a little uh, uh, 
decreasing, but gamma, the Latin American trend, the, the, the variants the, from Brazil, most probably it is going up. So it is alarming, the situation. And in this regard, this is our research institute, the Center for Research and Advanced Studies. We have many units across the country, the nation in Mexico. And it is basically a technological institute, and we are connected to many other institutes uh, across the world, including India, um, in some universities and research institutions uh, in South India, and of course, uh, IIT. We have uh, collaborations, and uh, we have students and others. So mostly the research in, in, in of COVID-19, it is the most leading research institute. You can see the all publications are in Spanish, so uh, this is the first, this is the only research institute that we could develop the diagnostic kit. In 2020, in the month of April 2020, uh, our group of researchers from our research institute, um, we could, I'm a part of this group. Uh, as a human ecologist, I'm working because I work in the rural areas of uh, the country, mostly from the south, southeast part of this country. So they, uh, they invited me to be a part of this group and um, uh, the people from uh, different laboratories like toxicology, molecular biology, they are working. And we, could, we have developed the diagnostic kit at a very reasonable price. And we, have, well, we are working on the genetic variants. The variants of SARS-CoV-2, not only in Mexico, but also in Peru and in Latin American countries all over the states of uh, Mexico. So we have many publications. So like this is a publication from the variants in Peru. So we have many publications. We have already published uh, papers uh, since January, February um, 2020 by the colleagues. And in some of these papers, I am the co-author. Um, I will discuss uh, some of these uh, uh, issues of these articles, like a uh, paper on um, the pregnant woman, the epidemiological characteristics, then uh, how the lifting of confinement, it, it had a negative impact on epidemiological characteristics. Then we had many papers on epidemiology of COVID-19 in Mexico in 2020, 2021. Almost every month we published papers, uh, like also in, in, among pregnant women and what are the 50 long-term effects, the possible effects, the negative outcomes, the um, uh, the fatal uh, consequences of COVID-19. Uh, then we, we, our colleagues also published on demographic and health indicators, the comorbidities, and also the issues related to social inequalities. Inequalities means the social cultural issues, the economic issues, uh, the marginalization, the rural and urban, and many other societies. So the social context of this issue, and then uh, the sexual dimorphism or the susceptibility to infection, as I was uh, mentioning. Um, then uh, our group, uh, we have published this epidemiology of coronavirus, uh, the sex difference, age sex differences, then maternal mortality, etc. So, you know, so epidemiology of uh, COVID-19. So what are the most common symptoms of COVID-19? And what are the comorbid comorbidities related, uh, associated with this disease? And um, what are the negative outcomes? These are the major uh, um, concern. You know, so uh, like we know what are the uh, major symptoms, what are the common symptoms of COVID-19 that people will have the sore throat, mostly. They will have fatigue, dry cough, uh, musculoskeletal pain that technically uh, the physicians will say arthralgia or the myalgia. And uh, almost all people, they will have headache and then sometimes vomiting and sometimes hemoptysis, like maybe mm, spitting of blood and diarrhea, of course, some GI tract disorders, dyspnea, like the shortness of breath, like um, respiratory problem. And then sputum production, like heavy cough in the bronchial tissues and lymphopenia that means the immune deficit due to the deficiency in the immune system they will have the lymphocytopenia that is a reduced number of lymphocytes so these are the common symptoms we can see in newspapers and news channels every day we are seeing how the patients are dying but um, it is common in all age groups it is not really that the only the um, uh, 
people over 40 or 50 or 60 years of age, they will be affected. And no, it is common. It is true for every age and male and um, uh, females. But um, the symptoms, actually people are dying due to the negligence. And of course, there are many comorbidities that will affect negatively. But due to negligence, like uh, two, two weeks back, one of my friends, childhood friends, she died uh, because uh, they delayed to hospitalize her. She had uh, diabetes and uh, thyroid problems, but they were just observing, well, quarantine, like, you know, this word is, it has become very common and isolation, home isolation. But when people, they have some comorbidities, like serious, serious issues like the hypertension or the diabetes or the, any kind of immunological uh, problem like autoimmune diseases, because mostly the women, they have the autoimmune, this is more common, it is more susceptible. Um, and um, so the symptoms will appear within five to six days. But the main incubation time, but the fatal complications, uh, it will come out in 14 days when um, these people who have more co comorbidities, they cannot recover. So uh, what are the fatal complications? When, well, a person may be cured, but um, this virus will leave some permanent damage uh, to our body. Like uh, people will get pneumonia because pneumonia, you know, sometimes we get confused with pneumonia if it is a comorbidity or it's a, a fatal complication. In Mexico and many other countries, we consider pneumonia as a negative outcome. It's a complication, fatal complication. It's a pulmonary edema. That's it's completely, it damages uh, some uh, the respiratory tissues, like the bronchial tissues. We can recover later, but it's very difficult. And it's an organ failure, permanent failure, severe pneumonia, septic shock. Like the infection will be so much widespread that organ failure, obvious, and very low BP, uh, blood pressure, and uh, the cardiac arrest. So it's very simple. So, and of course, acute respiratory distress syndrome. People who are have uh, who have asthma or who have COPD, they must be very uh, careful about this thing. Like. They have if they have comorbidities, even the obesity. I will come to this issue like obesity, why it is uh, important. So and these days we are seeing that uh, the news channels and other um, um, announcements, they are saying that people, we don't know who who are carrying this virus, you know, so asymptomatic. Sometimes we use we are we find another word presymptomatic. So those two words are very similar, but not exactly the same. Asymptomatic means that a person who is carrying the virus and he will be positive um, uh, if tested, you know, like the now famous RT-PCR test and anti uh, antibody test, antigen test, these are very common. So asymptomatic people, they are like carriers, but we don't know. These people are very uh, risk, you know, uh, so as and pre symptomatic that not yet infected, but they are susceptible to be infected. They have already the virus, but not really asymptomatic. But the disease will be developed, will develop in, 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 in a couple of days. So, uh, um, from 15 to 40 percent of these asymptomatic carriers, they uh, are at risk, not only for their own health risk, but also for the community. So in Mexico, the uh, this this pandemic started in the month of February, you know, so it's 20, as it, this paper says, it's 27th of February. And this first paper, uh, these colleagues, they have presented that uh, in, in the month of February, uh, they found the cases, as I told that the and uh, nutritional uh, the surve national surveillance data the dash from the dashboard of um, covid-19 um, uh, in mexico so we have the data of each individual of course their personal identity is not disclosed but we have seen the migratory data these people on 28th of february the cases um, they were from italy either the mexicans who were living in italy like students Mexican students who were in Italy, but due to the pandemic, they returned. 
to their home. So um, either and many Italian residents are living in Mexico and they have their family here and they came back to Mexico when uh, the pandemic, this, uh, this epidemic of COVID-19 was huge in Italy. So initially, this, the, the, the cases um, started with some uh, people who either came from Italy or the, uh, the Italian or the Mexicans. So, and most of these people um, were young and uh, like between 30 and 59 years of age that I see here in, the, in this article. And um, most of them are were men, like almost 60% were men. And they also died later due to this kind, some kind of comorbidities that they had. So in China at that time, uh, they had a mortality rate of almost 4%, but in Mexico, it was more than 6% uh, up to 11%. So like you see this, this time, the 30 to 50, four or 60 years of age, uh, the total number of a person like 10 to 11%. So the young people who are actually migrating from one country to other moving um, towards uh, Mexico where they are moving from uh, Italy or other countries in Europe and also in the United States coming back home. Uh, so, and the, the people who are working and mostly they are uh, men. So they got affected. So th this young, age group like 32, 54, 55, below 60, um, they got affected. And here in this graph, you can find uh, this figure, you, uh, this graph, you can find a very interesting issue. Like imported means who migrated, who imported the, this disease uh, to Mexico. Initially, like uh, in, at the initial stage, you can find these imported cases, but later all are local infection. That means, uh, um, the COVID-19 was not a Mexican disease. It came from outside. So initially it was imported from others, from people who came from other countries. Of course, we have the migratory data because um, when you go through the customs and uh, the security clearance in the airport, unless uh, some people who are coming illegally, many people from uh, like Honduras and uh, Guatemala and Costa Rica, Belize, some Central American countries, um, they moved to Mexico for treatment, for better living. Well, not only during this pandemic, they always move uh, to Mexico for better living, you know, and um, of course, uh, there are many illegal immigrants, like in the Europe and many other parts of the world uh, where you cannot close the border and people can come uh, the, pol the border is a political issue, but people can move anywhere. So initially, those cases, the officially registered cases, those were imported, and later it has become a local one. So this is the, the male and female, you see, like almost 60, 40 initially that time, but later it came down to like 51, 52 male, 51, 52%, and 48% females, and now it is reverse, like at this moment, like 2021, it is like 52% and 49%, 48% mean why I will discuss. The next um, uh, uh, epidemic, this is a paper published into 2021. Uh, so it was initially and after one year, what happens? The scenario is the same. Like you see the 20, now the people of 20, um, these people are getting affected, like 25% of these cases, new cases, uh, almost 26% and 27% of 30 to 39. Young people still, they are getting affected because they are going out for work. Many people have lost their job and uh, they, have, uh, they have stopped uh, studying. And so mostly the young people, they are getting affected. And um, you can see the contact with COVID-19 patient Yes, most of the cases, the positive cases came out from the contact with COVID-19, almost 54%. And what are the relationships of COVID-19 patients? Mostly the family, almost 56% of these COVID-19 patients, they got infected from their family members and co-workers, 30%. And friends, 20%. So, and the people who had social security, of course, the people who had social security, they are registered cases because most of these registered cases either in the public and private hospitals. Well, in Mexico, it's uh, different from India. Here, uh, majority of these of public hospitals, they attend uh, patients. 
and uh, there is no private um, uh, because government doesn't allow government is not allowing the private entrepreneurs like hospitals to um, give vaccines or to provide uh, uh, medical services so the social security means the people in mexico the all um, citizens of, or the people who are living in mexico may not be citizens like uh, like permanent residents they have the visa so they have the social security social security means they have a social security card and they will and almost 80 percent more than 80 percent of the social people um, who are registered they were had social security and you can see the non-communicable diseases like comorbidities uh, the hypertension diabetes and another interesting issue that influenza vaccination it has become common for last uh, during last few years that we are taking influenza um, vaccine every year so we can see that people who got affected they didn't have almost 76 percent who didn't have influenza vaccine they got um, infected uh, of covid of sars cov 2 and these are the common symptoms as i told that is very common that abdominal pain uh, dyspnea like breathing difficulty conjunctivitis and diarrhea and many other things so uh, so uh, these are the um, issues like at this situation but now we are moving to the six another issue very interesting six differences in the susceptibility and uh, here is the article that i published in the last year because um, when I saw the dashboard, um, either um, because that time uh, you could act, you could access uh, many dashboard, like dashboard from many other countries, including United States, Italy, Spain, Germany, France, of course China, um, uh, England, the United Kingdom, and U USA, like the Russia and other countries, uh, of course Mexico. So I have seen that there is a difference, and why? the males are getting more affected why females initially as a bio, as a human biologist or a social scientist uh, i understood that of course the um, the men are going out of house for work or any other things that's why they are at risk major risk but what are the other underlying reasons behind this the sex difference so this is the paper that uh, out of my own interest uh, last year uh, initial with this initial data, data like in the, I think in April May I have published so uh, reviewing the literature uh, of course uh, we know the sex difference or sexual dimorphism is a product of evolution uh, with the students of anthropology we know these pre-humans and humans and other mammals a human evolution we can see the sex differences in uh, birds mammals and uh, mostly our pre-humans like the um, Australopithecus, so Homo erectus, and early Homo sapiens. So, so sex difference is very common in their size and shape, these morphological characters. But what are the uh, reasons? So, during this period, they have uh, there are many other publications related to this that uh, I was reviewing. So, this article that I published it is a review of literature, and also to explore some um immunological and physiological basis of the sex difference due to the uh, this uh, in re related to the susceptibility to the infection there i found this re a review that you can see in most of the countries the males are affected more affected uh, is uh, this paper was published in the nature review and you can see the left side the blue um, the males are more affected and, and in all age groups, in all age groups and mostly in the, in the uh, advanced age group. So then I analyze the data, uh, downloading the database from different countries like Qatar, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Ghana from the dashboard of uh, WH. So I found actually it, it was not really true that always in all countries, the males were more affected in like uh, of course, this left side, like Qatar, Bangladesh, and up to Argentina, the males were more affected. But here, in these countries like Austria, Norway, Germany, Italy, Croatia, Sweden, Denmark, females were more affected. So, what is the reason? You can see that most of these countries, uh, most of these countries, they are uh, economically little um, higher. So male and female both are working and on this in this side you see the 
countries were more conservative in that sense that males are more working and females are at home so of course there is a there is a there is an insight of this issue why males were getting affected in some countries of low and median middle income countries and why females and male females were also more affected in these countries so like uh, in spain males were more affected that time in april 2020 i have reviewed these papers and then journal of infection also mm, they have published a very interesting paper how the smoking habits and hospitalization was related to pneumonia and its sex differences and journal all these papers are uh, open access so you know so in general the females they have more they have stronger immune response compared to men they are more less susceptible to get infected but biologically because the sex hormones sex steroids and other immunological aspects they help women to protect uh um, like if you see the demography it's also it will also show that more females the women are more resistant to diseases uh but of course there are some if you consider why hiv is more prevalent in among women it's a social issue um uh, but and also the autoimmune diseases like lupus is more common among women so regarding any aut aut autoimmune disease women are more susceptible but this kind of um viral uh, like uh, streptococcus or others you know the related to any pathogens women are less less susceptible like there was another uh, in, two other important articles that i found there are many others like the sex drives of dimorphic immune response so you can if you um, go through the paper that i published last year uh, the susceptibility uh, uh, to the infection uh, so why males are more affected you will find the review of literature and then you will um, uh, read those papers um, so um, these are the major um, factors that is that's why the women get less affected by sex chrom sex chromosomes we most of these immune Im related genes are located in the sex chromosomes and the epigenetic factors of course sex hormones estrogens they protect and extragonadal factors so immune immunity wise the women are more affected so that's this is the reason that in epidemiology of covid-19 across the world in any country women are less affected but remember i will show you the women are less susceptible to infection but once affected the epidemiological results show that women are dying earlier than men so in they are on, on the one hand they are less susceptible to infection but on the other hand if they are getting affected they are not surviving this rate of survival is much less in among women now the comorbidities you know in april 20 the general cases of fatality as i told that between 7 and 11% and most of these cases in mexico uh, related to some two basic issues the comorbidities related to the death of covid due to covid 19 in mexico was uh, obesity i will come to this point why obesity is one of the major risk factors hypertension and uh uh social cultural issues that is social inequality um poverty rate in some places because you know the huge social and uh, economic discrimination still exists in in mexico people either very rich or very poor um like the middle class uh, concept is not really found in mexico either people are very rich they have very good salary or penniless so huge differences but the government is uh, giving support but in most of the cases like other countries we find the comorbidities of course pneumonia as i told it is not really considered as a comorbidity but a negative outcome but um uh, this is the issue the like pneumonia hypertension obesity diabetes mellitus so you see 
except pneumonia, this hypertension, obesity, and diabetes, diabetes mellitus. These three are highly prevalent in Mexico, highly prevalent. You can see this is the data from 31st May 2021. Mm, the database, uh, as I uh, found, you see the hypertension. Um, and you know, two types of patients are there, the ambulatory and hospitalized. So, of course, the hospitalized patients. And in Mexican population, these three comorbidities are the major reasons behind the death of due to COVID-19, that people uh, have hypertension, arterial hypertension, obesity, and diabetes. But it was, of course, other factors like asthma and other chronic diseases, other autoimmune diseases, cardiovascular diseases, chronic kidney diseases, you know, this is another uh, uh, major uh, issue, health-related issues in, in Mexico, because uh, the drinking water, we, this country, we have huge problem in the drinking water supply, um, because there is no water purification system. Like the, we, we cannot drink the, the direct from the tap, the, from the tap. So, and um, huge minerals. Um, are, found, are there in the in the water and it it affects so chronic kidney disease is, a, is very common, particularly in the southern part of Mexico. Um, uh, so, like this um, uh, paper that one of our colleagues uh, from another university uh, published, he published on demographic comorbidity and conditions, medical conditions. So, in this paper. Uh, it is the same issue like the hospitalized patients. It is an age group and hospitalized patients. So number of hospitalized patients is going up with the age. So people of advanced age, they are getting more hospitalized because they have more comorbidities, they have more severities, um, and they have less um, uh, immunity, resistance, and so they are getting more hospitalized. And more like home quarantine ambulatory. So are, Mostly they are the young people. They are not recommended to be hospitalized. So another paper by our colleagues, um, we have published this clinical course and severity out outcome. Here, um, in 2020, we have seen that active smoking, obesity, diabetes, respiratory, hypertension, cardiovascular disease is a regression model. And we have seen that smoking, uh, obesity, diabetes, Hypertension and cardiovascular disease. These are the major compounding factors, like the predictors of in the model of COVID-19 uh, death. Of course, pregnancy is another major issue factors, but in the model it shows. So the, uh, related to pneumonia and in the mechanical ventilation, who were the, in the mechanical ventilation, it is the same like obesity and diabetes. So obesity and diabetes is common in all models, and of course in hypertension. So obesity, diabetes and hypertension, these three comorbidities were common in every case, like if the people had pneumonia or in the mechanical ventilation or in the intensive care or in hospital death, in all cases. So smoking was also found another major habitual uh, factor uh, that caused the death of due to COVID-19. So another uh, paper that um, uh, my colleagues, my collaborators, they have published the demographic and health indicators. So in this cases, in this case, uh, the migration that imported that uh, issue that we, I was talking about, the it has become more critical in this country due to the migration. And in this model, um, the, my colleagues, they have considered that uh, what are the major factors? And they found the migration and urbanization are the two major factors. That means the people are coming to the cities for their treatment. People are coming from other countries to Mexico. It, so migration and urbanization, these were the two major um, predictors in the regression models they found. In other, like in incidents, the number of cases, and also in the confirmatory cases. So migration and urbanization were the two major factors that we found um, for the increasing of uh, COVID-19 cases. And also the COVID-19 cases, uh, we see the average is like 45. That means like 30 to 60, 45, 46. This is the average cases are more prone to be affected. And hospitalization, another issue. And fatal outcome 
when uh, in the, right now the females are having more like 68 percent of females are dying so so out of these comorbidities like obesity hypertension and other respiratory disorders diabetes mellitus obesity you know it is related to diabetes it is related to metabolic syndrome but obesity in mexico is very common um, if um, in this uh, in this figure we can see the obesity is in third position or the second comorbidity but actually if we go through the data of the people the death or cases of comor of of covid-19 we can see the obesity is the first uh, factor um, the most prevalent uh, cases of the uh, death cases is uh, the people who were obese where because the pathogenesis uh, the the pathophysiology of obesity is very crucial you know so it's a chronic disease and uh, um, obesity means the increased storage of energy in the lipocytes so it causes the hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the lipocytes that means it, the adipose tissue volume increases so it levers free fatty acids are there that impacts endocrine and mechanical function um, uh, of the body so um, accordingly, the pathophysiology of obesity reduces the immunity. And at the same time, the people who are having uh, central obesity or the abdominal obesity, with increased abdominal pressure, they have dyspnea, like the respiratory, the, like breathing shortage. So the obesity not only affecting their internal system, like functional, pathological, pathophysiological system, uh, um, aspects of, of obesity, but also mechanically, like due to the abdominal obesity is putting pressure, increased abdominal obesity. They cannot, the, the risk, uh, they cannot um, um, uh, breathe properly. So the, this is the major reason. So obesity is a part of hypertension that increases hypertension and of course, metabolic syndrome. So ultimately, it, the fatal outcome is the in, in, if these people, the obesity, uh, you know, um, at this moment, the um, obesity is in Mexico. It's the sixth position in, in, in the world. Of course, after some preventive, taking some preventive measures, it, initially it was the second highest uh, pre, uh, cases in, in of obesity was found in Mexico next to the United States. But now it has become sick. It has uh, it is Mexico ranks sixth in the world. And, um, you know, it is due to the food habit. It is due to the lifestyle habits of the Mexicans. Uh, there are morphological issues also, social issues. Uh, you know, uh, psychosocial stress, the unemployment. Um, uh, so the, path the pathophysiology of obesity is related to the biological issues like the immune system and others but at the same time the social and economic issues like psycho psychosocial stress it develops some stress related factors that will uh, modify the metabolic system and um, the food habit you know uh, the industrialized food we call the junk foods so uh, high energy diet and the calorie drink like the coca-cola and others you know the soft drinks they have high energy and um, less physical activity and the morphological characters like mexico you know is a country of basically the country of indigenous communities but uh, it was a colony of uh, spain it is the difference between mexico and india because we are genetically uh, more conservative in india that we can distinguish between indigenous uh, communities and the general population others who are not in not indigenous uh, but in Mexico the population structure uh, is different in genetical structure and social culture it is different because in the concept of indigenous it is not really the same as we find in India so uh, they mostly during the uh, colonial period during colonial period the people were converted uh, into Christianity and uh, the genetic admixture with the European strain. So in that sense, um, um, uh, they, um, 
there, there is no indigenous people, really the Indians in that sense, we can say in Mexico, but uh, they still carry the genetic variants or the alleles in that sense of this indigenous community like Maya, Aztec and others. So uh, during colonial period, um, the huge marginalization, it affected their human biology. So we, we have evidence that, for example, in Yucatan and southern Mexican states, um, people before uh, the Mayans, before uh, the people of Maya community, I'm saying, before colonial period, they were taller. But during colonial period, they become short. And now there is a trend, there is a secular trend, uh, that the young generation people, they are taller than their parents. So we can find the grandparents, they are short, their fathers like, the short means like 150, 140 centimeters, the male and female, and uh, the, the fathers, they are like 160 and 150. And now the children, like in 18, 19 years of age, they are 170, 180 centimeters. So the morphological characteristics, when, a people, when people are short in height, they have, and they are due to their lifestyle, bad lifestyle habits, they consume more food, less physical activity, higher social psychosocial stress, they develop obesity. And consequently, the obesity, it has negative impacts on health. And during this kind of pandemic, of course, it is uh, nothing to say. So in, in Mexico, we have some uh, um, Mexican National Health and Nutrition Survey every after 10 years. Um, and uh, every after five years, we have the halfway, we say halfway, like 2010, 2020, in 2015, we had the midway survey. So uh, Mexican National Health and Nutrition Survey, it is also an open access database. Anyone from any part of this world, they can access. So it is, there is nothing um, uh, to be hidden because this is the motto. This is the uh, main objective of scientific research that you cannot hold your information within yourself. You have to share the information. People can use the database and you can see. Um, so uh, like last year, my colleagues from our department, we, they have published this paper, the common sense preparedness of uncommon adversities. Very interesting paper. I will explain some part of uh, these um, issues that we always discuss because here the people are um, human ecologists. So they also reported that obesity prevalence in, in, in 32 Mexican states was for more than 40 percent. And while the BMI, the body mass index, the famous index to, to, to diagnose obesity was 29. So and here we can see the prevalence of obesity and prevalence of COVID mortality. We, and the distribution of uh, obesity and distribution of COVID mortality across the Mexican states, it is almost same. You can see the these states. Um, well, above this is, it is California, this up, upper California, and this is a low, in the United States, and this is a lower California in 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 in, 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 in Mexico. And you can see this is a, um, the bordering states. And another important thing you can find: all the bordering states they have high obesity and high. Um, uh, COVID-19 deaths. So there are some migratory issues, there are some social issues, and of course, across the Mexican states, uh, there's huge social disparity. Uh, remember the the uh, uh, the traffic light concept. Most of these states in the central part of Mexico, uh, like Mexico City, and Puebla, and other cities, big cities, they have more health facilities. People are rich in that sense. They have more private uh, hospitals and government hospitals. But relatively in southern part of Mexico, where we live, are socioeconomically very poor. And it is bordering with other countries. Like uh, here we are living in Yucatan state. And uh, this is another state called Quintana Roo. This is Cam Campeche. And so these are very near to Guatemala. It's bordering with Guatemala, Belize, and other central part. So people are, these are migratory issues that imported COVID-19 cases were very high. And uh, of course, uh, like more, little more than 100 years back, the southern part of the United States were part of Mexico. See, so the California, Texas, these were within Mexico, these are uh, Arizona, these were within Mexico. So many Mexican people, like genetically, they are Mexicans, but they are US Americans. But the people of California, Arizona, if you visit, 
they are Spanish speaking. They have the Mexican origin, the same uh, morphological characteristics, same genetical characteristics are there. So bordering states, they have many families across the border, like in Upper California, in the United States and Lower California in uh, the California, the state of California in the United States and Lower California in the Mexico. They have the same. They have many families, so they migrate. And here also the Arizona and uh, um, um, uh, and Texas. So obesity and COVID-19 mortality, these are the, on, the, on the same. So now, um, so these are the situation like comorbidity, why uh, COVID-19 uh, comorbidities and among the comorbidities, why obesity in Mexico is one of the major factors. Now we are moving towards the um, another uh, issue that is very important, how the pregnant women are getting affected. It's a very important issue. You know, this is a paper on COVID-19 uh, during the, pre uh, the, 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 um, the pregnancy. And here they have found that, well, this is in Spanish, but um, I am trying to explain you like intensive care of COVID-19 patients. In the United States, 10% of, um, uh, of the pregnant women more, almost 11 percent they were they had um, they had to receive intensive care in Italy 10 percent China 7 percent Spain 10 percent so almost 10 percent except a few countries like three percent or two percent most of the countries in most of the countries almost 10 percent of the pregnant women got affected and uh, with COVID-19 cases and they had to receive intensive cares and the COVID-19 positive among the neonates, neonates, that means the um, newly <clears throat> born babies. We can see then Italy, Iran, USA, Italy, China, and between 8 to 12 percent. So like 10 percent pregnant mothers, they had to receive intensive care. And almost 10 percent plus minus two, the neonates, they had COVID-19. So it's a very serious situation. So also in, um, in another paper by our colleague, and actually um, a, one of these co-authors, she's my PhD student, uh, and um, COVID-19 in Mayan pregnant women, like in Yucatan. And you can see, this is Merida, this is the city. And the pregnant mothers who were affected, they moved from these uh, distant places of Yucatan, this is the Yucatan state, to Merida. So they came to Merida for treatment. So migration is another issue. So, so during this period of April 2020 to January 2021, there are, in percentage, there you cannot, you can say huge, but um, of course, there are many cases. Uh, like this is the paper that uh, recently, uh, like in the month of July, uh, it was published, but it was based on the data of almost one year. Um, uh, last week, I think it was published and we got the PDF of this paper. It is also open access, you can find. And this is the uh, demographic data, the maternal death. You see, in the, in the last 10 years, we have seen that 2020, 2010 to 2019, it was it reduced. But suddenly in 2020, it increased. But why? The, the national demo, demographic data it is also open access. And we found the 47% of maternal mortality death. It is not due to the COVID, but in general increased. Why? Then we tried to explore the why and how the mothers, the pregnant mothers are uh, dying. So we found that adolescent mothers below 19 years of age and above 30 years, eight years of age. Of course, these two vulnerable ages to become pregnant, there are many other um, biological and health related issues related to the adolescent pregnancy and advanced age pregnancy of about 34 years, 38 years. And almost 88, 84% of this maternal death, maternal mortality during pregnancy occurred in these two age groups, below 19 and above 38. And Almost 67% of these women, they had fatal outcome of pneumonia and they had to transfer to hospitalized uh, unit, respiratory unit, almost 90% of the cases, so 36, 37% cases, they had to receive intensive care. And we found what are the reasons? 
a, a model of regression, they have found that mothers who were diabetic, who were uh, sm who had smoking habit, who had cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, diabetes, asthma, um, and hypertension, they were more susceptible to get infected and fatal outcome. So, so up to this point, we I think I have covered almost uh, everything about the biology, comorbidity, epidemiology. Now. Uh, in the last section, I would like to explore something um, which may be interesting, uh, the social inequality, the human ecological perspective of uh, COVID-19. What is the role of government and social awareness in Mexico? So in the human ecological perspective, we, we, there is a, well, we, in this paper, my colleagues from my department, they have uh, developed uh, this kind of model, you know, the how the social cultural systems, the well-being, human well-being, it is related to the ecosystem, social cultural system and human biology. What is human ecology? Human ecology is just uh, interaction, human nature interaction. So, so human ecology, um, we can, we use this term like reproduction, social and biological reproduction. That means uh, that people shape their societies with their own characteristics and um, people produce and reproduce behaviors and customs. So reproduction is not only biological, but it is also social culture. So we produce and we reproduce uh, the, um, the, um, the, 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 our culture, our behavior, etc. So human ecology of COVID-19 is of course related to this kind of behavioral pattern of these people, not only their lifestyle, not only their psychological, psychosocial stress, but altogether how the other factors in the ecosystems are related to the, uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, infection and death. So we can see in the perspective of uh, COVID, uh, in the perspective of human ecology, how the environmental factors, the climate, the physical environmental factors and the uh, immediate household environmental factors, the hygiene, lifestyle habits, social, psychological, uh, psychosocial stress, economic factors, dietary habits, activity patterns, their entire behavior, how it is influencing um, uh, uh, the well being of human. So, you know, this is a current ep epidemiological context, but Definitely, uh, we will face more new pandemics and we have to be get prepared with the situation. We have some limitations. We have some advantages of immune system. We have some limitations also, but we can recover. We can um, fight with any kind of pandemic if we can control ourselves, if we can change our behavioral patterns, if we can change our lifestyle habits. Otherwise, it will be difficult, you know. So last year, um, our uh, collaborators, they have published another very interesting paper. It is also uh, open access. You can find uh, Barry Boggin. He's a very famous human biologist. Um, and he was proposing a new model, theoretical model, to explain um, not only COVID, but uh, in this paper, he has explained uh, what happened during World War and others, other situations, other pandemics, other epidemics. So how social, environmental, and economic issues are related uh, to any kind of well-being, say human well-being. So they call SEPE, like social, economic, political, emotional issue, and how maternal health is related because, you know, our life, starts in the womb. So prenatal um, state, like uh, we call intergenerational. It, so what we have, our biological capital, it is actually related to the biological capital, biological and social capital of my mother and my grandmother. Why not the fathers? We are saying because we know the children, the kids, the, the baby is much related to the Mother, because uh, mother is not only sharing his uh, her genetical and biological issues but, but aspects, but also environmental, like intrauterine environmental factors. So maternal health 
and gestational environment is very important where a mother is transmitting her capital like her biological capital um, which is a product of um, of our social and cultural background of mother and also her mother that means transgenerational intergenerational factors so what we have today we have gained from our um, grandparents mothers and of course uh, um, during early childhood uh, in during infancy and childhood the environmental factors our food habit and any kind of disease you know during growth period it is like uh, bank balance i have uh, 100 rupees in the bank uh, so uh, at at the time of any crisis we have to take money from the account our body is just like that when a child is growing so um, during any disease condition, maybe in, uh, due to some environmental factors or maybe due to some immunity related or genetic factors, uh, during any disease, energy will be spent for maintenance. So not for growth. So during any disease, the child, this the growth will be stopped. So the energy will be spent to maintain, to recover. So maternal health during gestation and also in the early infancy childhood phase is very important to develop the capital so ultimately when a child will be adult he or she will be susceptible to any disease or infection that those are not related to the immediate health condition it has a compound it's the accumulated effect of the transgenerational factors and also the environmental factors, human ecological factors during uh, the child's uh, growth period, like prenatal, early, neonatal, neonatal, then childhood, infancy, childhood, and etc. So any kind of health outcome in adulthood is the, the cumulative effect of all these biological and social cultural aspects. That means in human ecology. So in this uh, paper, the, uh, the Barry and other colleagues, they have mentioned that what are the major outcomes? What are the major consequences? Um, Barry and other colleagues, they have shown that, uh, like in, uh, in World War II and others, low birth weight. So low birth weight is a negative outcome. Greater risk for infection. What are the negative outcomes of this kind of poor maternal health during pregnancy? Like in COVID-19, it's a crisis. We have not only the health crisis, but also we, also, we are also facing social and economic crisis, psychological crisis, and particularly the mothers. So the mothers, the maternal environment, internal, uh, uh, the, the intrauterine environment, it has some negative impacts on the new nets, like start with the low birth weight, greater, and it will include greater risk of infection. And then consecutively, it will poor learning, poor school performance and greater risk for psychological problems. So these are the accumulated effects, negative effects. So likewise, as we found in World War or any other uh, epidemic earlier, the current COVID-19 crisis is a biocultural in nature. It is not only an issue of epidemiology, it is not only issue of health, but it's a biocultural. So and what are the major impacts you can explain through this uh, uh, SEPE model? social, economic, political, and emotional. Emotional stress, and ultimately the maternal emotional stress is the one of the major factors, is the root of this crisis. So another paper from Mexico, they have explained the, how the social inequalities, the, despite the social economic um, discrepancies, the poverty, marginalization, um, food insecurity, those are related to COVID-19, the distribution of disease in rural and urban areas according to the rate of poverty, according to the uh, communities who are facing uh, food insecurity. Uh, like uh, in January, February this year, I, I have finished a project very interesting that how um, food insecurity is related to diabetes. That means food insecurity um, due to the joblessness or the unemployment, uh, it generates psychosocial stress the psychosocial stress ultimately affects the immune, immune system and the 
behavioral pattern of the of people and it develops the obesity yeah, and also the due to the uh, typical morpho morphological characteristics of yucatan people they are very short and fat so they develop obesity and cardiovascular problems and um, others and how ultimately they become they have the metabolic syndrome so diabetes is the outcome that we see but what are the major reasons it is not only biological factors not only health related but psychosocial factor it is same in 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 covid 19 social inequality it we cannot we cannot prevent covid 19 only with vaccine only with medicine no we have to check the social inequality what is the social inequality we have to mitigate the poverty and other things like um and many people say what is the difference bit of covid 19 in among indigenous community than others and this is a report of uh, government of mexico of indigenous community we can see uh, the people well here is the yucatan um, highest prevalent um, uh, uh, prevalence of covid 19 in mexico because yucatan is the state of the maya community maya in that sense still the, in the rural part there are some maya community of course they are mestizo but they have the genetically they, they have more mayan strain so highest rate of covid 19 cases among the indigenous communities in that sense among mayas in in yucatan and we can see the age related factors that we can see again the 30 to 50 460 the highest number of cases of this age group so it is the same with the general population so there is no it is um, uh, like a, a couple of months back uh, I, I, I i was uh, in a webinar organized by the anthropological survey of india and one of our colleagues uh, he was presenting a, a very interesting information from andaman and nicobar islands the uh, indigenous communities and how the indigenous indigenous what is the real situation of covid 19 in indigenous communities but as i told that indigenous concept in india is very different from mexico is there is so in mexico there is no reason to divide communities but uh, um, indigenous communities in general they are living in that sense the maya people they are living in rural areas they speak in maya they don't speak in uh, spanish they are they have different lifestyle they have different uh, cultural background bioculture bioculture issues different but the trend is almost similar like males they are more affected like 54 percent females are uh 46 percent and the age groups and distribution of the confirmed cases is also you can see we can see the age group of the young people they are getting more affected and hospitalized patients are 30 percent and the home quarantine are 70 percent and most of these cases again in the in these communities indigenous communities the cough headache fever musculoskeletal pain as it was in the uh, general so there is in reality, there is no difference between indigenous community and non-indigenous communities in Mexico regarding this epidemiology of of, uh, of COVID-19. Like, like it is the same like hypertension, obesity, COPD. These are the major comor comorbidities, like uh, asthma, CBD. So it is the same, and also the death cases, as the most of the infected cases are in the age group of between 30 to 59 and the death cases of course this is uh, but you see as i told that females were less affected but while they are affected they are um uh, here the 63 percent um of these females who got affected they died so now the role of the government you know here in mexico to deal with this epidemiology uh, the pandemic government is the is playing the major role there is no non-government agents and the vaccines they are under control of the army government is not intervening no other private hospitals only the army the marines and the uh, army so they are controlling everything so it, nothing is in the hand of government government is just like a facilitator they are only like a, a mediator but army is controlling so it is under huge control because Mexico, in Mexico, the budget, fiscal budget, they didn't um, uh, allow to produce vaccine at this moment. That's why it is another drawback of this country that they are buying. The people, the government is buying uh, vaccine from other countries like the United States, mostly the Pfizer, um, Moderna and uh, Johnson & Johnson, very little and AstraZeneca. And uh, from India, I have heard that uh, they have approved one vaccine, but still uh, it is not yet 
uh, not yet arrived because the WHO they have not approved. Uh, like he's the governor with this K95, he's the governor and he's visiting. It is not for only publicity, not for the the media, but in reality, you can find the governor of a state, like uh, in governor means uh, it's the head of the state. Uh, like India, we have the different political structure, uh, like we have the chief ministers and governors, but governor here is like our chief minister, you know, the states. And he visits everywhere, everywhere. You can find a uh, governor in front of your house in one day. So he is visiting all colonies and he got affected twice COVID-19 in one year. Still, but the Mauricio Villa, he is visiting almost all places of this state to look after the people. He is visiting the uh, vaccination center. And you know, initially into 2020, when the government started vaccination process, in the street, whenever they found any old people, like above 60 years of age, advanced age people, they started giving a vaccine without registering, without, at this moment, they were registering, you know, in companies. Here, the e-governance is very strong. So, uh, here we, we can see the red car and some one was driving and they were asking the age and uh, a lady she was receiving vaccine on the street so in this way they are trying and i also received vaccine uh, a few months back so and all the major hospitals you know they have been converted and these are some of the temporary hospitals in rural areas that people they don't need to come over to merida the city uh, but some temporary hospitals with this kind of facilities the government has developed. And here is the governor. He was supervising everywhere, everywhere. So, and at that after vaccination, the 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 all these materials they are uh, taking out to, to this kind of with this kind of vehicles, highly protected under the uh, supervision of the army. And during this uh, rainy season, we have hurricane, we have tornado and other things. The governor himself, he was visiting these places, affected places, and the volunteers, not related to any political party, the volunteers, the young people, they visited the house to give them the, uh, any kind of help, like food and other things. This is the Mexico City, you see, one of the biggest cities in the world. The situation is just like India, the people, um, it is very difficult to stop people to go come out from home so there is there is no quarantine so the situation in mexico city is different people are working huge number of people on the street you can find but public transport they are still maintaining the distance and uh, like in in the bus and also in the metro and uh, in the in merida it's uh, where we are living is a relatively a very small city here in the street, very few people you can find, and the volunteers, they, you can find everywhere. They are giving sanitizers everywhere. They are moving around. So uh, government is trying to control in this way. So like it was a picture before pandemic and after pandemic, government is insisting people to use bicycles. So uh, the streets, they have the, uh, the avenues, they have divided, uh, they have prepared a, a cycle bay in this way. So people are using less car, individual cycle so they are using and every after uh, 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 travel like a bus from one route uh, they are sanitizing um, and inside the car they have the sanitizers and everywhere and in the beach also there is no restriction but awareness so people are very much aware of this disease and how to deal with like people are moving but they are respecting the rules and they are aware of this disease and they know how to protect and in the beach also the, the volunteers are moving around. So, and everywhere we can find this kind of um, announcement by the governor. We are working from home. The students are from primary to um, uh, university. Uh, they are presenting exams. And this is one of the um, um, master's thesis exam that we had online. Um, and another um, thesis, uh, the, my student, uh, she was graduated. Uh, so we are working from home. So this is the message. So there are more research. I think it is needed for in this kind of pandemic, uh, but only research, only uh, uh, literature is not enough. The unless we we can, unless we control ourselves, our lifestyle, our behavior patterns, and it is the role of it's very important role of the government uh, to. 
uh, deal with this problem related to social inequality, poverty. That means not only the epidemiological issues, but also the biocultural, social, cultural, human ecological issues must be um, considered. So uh, that's all at this moment. And if you have any query, of course, you are welcome. And you have my email. And if you and this is my WhatsApp, if you want to get in touch, of course, you are welcome. So that's all from my part at this moment. Thank you very much, speaker, sir. This is uh, really enlightening for us. And your deliberation really shows that how much hard work and how much labor you have done for this research work. Thank you very much. And now it's uh, we are going for the question answer session. And I would like to request Dr. Joita Ghoshal Roy to conduct this question answer session. Uh, good evening. Uh, good evening, Shudip. Thank you, Joita Di. Hope all is well. Uh, yes, it was nice hearing your presentation. Uh, there is one observation from Dr. Bhattacharya uh, that uh, maybe Mexican have uh, you have mentioned in your uh, lecture that uh, due to immig immigration and migration problem, the uh, COVID virus has spread. It might be vice versa also. The immigrant issue is, uh, um, I think, relevant across the globe in the present context uh well i i i think uh vice versa means you are um, or dr Bhattacharya was talking about that um immigration like people are going out of mexico yes yes uh not really um mm. uh, according to the um, the migration data of the mm. uh, of mexico uh mm. well we had no restriction Mm -hmm. But for two reasons, mainly the Mexicans didn't go out of their country. First of all, mm -hmm. people were receiving enough medical support. The United States, of course, it is, people were coming from the United States to receive medical health support at a more reasonable cost. So it was not cost effective for the Mexicans to go other countries like in the United States for their um treatment if they were affected infected like for example during vaccination the people the mexicans or the people who are living in mexico we received vaccine here but many people who had money mm. when who were rich they uh, they moved to the nearby states like in the texas or arizona they have their families of course, all the, the states in the United States of America, they're not allowing foreigners to receive a vaccine. But once you are there, you can receive vaccine. They don't discriminate. Oh, you are not US American, so you will not receive. No, once you are there, you can receive. But there were some restrictions in some states. So people from Mexico in some for the last few months, they went to the United States, but very few people. How many people they, they can move to the United States? Uh, twice because first of all they have to go for a rt-pcr test mm -hmm. and they have to go there they have to stay they go there receive vaccine and come back again after three weeks they have to travel so almost the 800 or 900 us dollars to and fro for every time so almost two thousand dollars and a hotel stay and rt-pcr test every time so it is huge expensive so people are were not moving out of mexico at least the migration data, immigration data, this shows that Mexicans were not going out to Mexico because they were receiving health support here. And um, people were, the Mexicans are not living in, in the Europe or in, in the United States. Rather, people who were, the Mexicans who are living in those, those countries, they were coming back home. And the people from other countries to receive uh, proper health support, they were coming to Mexico, not only from Europe or United States, also huge number of people from Latin America. This is the social economic scenario. So the the um, the vice versa in that sense, it is not really um, uh, not the real situation. Okay, but that's an interesting observation also that higher economic groups migrating to uh, trying to receive vaccination from uh, neighboring country. That's no, 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 it, it, no, not higher uh, economic group like US Americans. They are not coming to Mexico for vaccination. Mm. 
No, no, my Mexicans but, are going. Yeah, of course. It is, uh -huh. of course, like uh -huh. many of my colleagues, mm -hmm. many of my colleagues, because we received vaccine as a teacher, you know, as a researcher. Yeah. Okay. Uh, when uh, my age group of 40 to 49, they didn't receive. Okay. So, um, uh, but uh, some people were impatient. So mm -hmm. they, and they, many, as I told that many Mexicans, they have their families in the United States because mm -hmm. almost half of the United States well, Mex well, within Mexico, are a little more than 100 years back. So they have many families. They can easily move and register okay. them in the, in the, in the vaccination. Mm -hmm. uh, like a few months back, I, we were thinking that we are receiving vaccine. What, what about our uh, son? Mm -hmm. He's too young and we can send him to, uh, to Texas to get mm -hmm. vaccine. But um, I said, no, uh, well, we were very much worried because he's studying medicine and his uh, clinical rotation will start. But he told, no, we'll, we'll get vaccine by August. So okay. now they have received. So this way, the, the people, but very few, few percentage of rich people who have money, they are moving to the United States for vaccine. Okay. But, but it is not uh, the Mexicans uh, in general, like 98 or 99 percent Mexicans, they are staying within the country for vaccination and other medical support. Okay. Our next question is from our principal, madam. Uh, whether there is any data to support uniformity of testing or diagnosis of patients irrespective of sex. Uh, can it be that females are dying early, maybe due to delayed diagnosis? Is there any gender discrimination? Well, probably, uh, I don't know whether it was deleted uh, in my presentation because it was there. Let me see, I can show you because uh, last year, uh, I published another paper on this issue like, uh, uh, well, there is actually no discrimination, mm, uh, like male-female discrimination or gender bias regarding taste or regarding um, medical facilities. No, because it is legally prohibited. In Mexico, it is really legally prohibited and here, um, the law, federal law, is very stringent any, uh, against any kind of uh, violence against women and child. Very strong. And actually, the women are, um, they receive priority for any, like the pregnant women and other women. Um, so there is no discrimination. There is no discrimination or gender bias for testing or uh, diagnosis or the treatment. But uh, biologically, women are less susceptible. They are more resistant to the disease. But biologically, once they are affected, um, they are more susceptible to die earlier. So uh, I think I, unfortunately, I have deleted those uh, two slides. Um, uh, last year, I pu we published another paper, H6 variation of... Um, it's a variation of uh, uh, the COVID-19 patients only with the death cases. The H6 mm, variation of the hospitalization, the period of hospitalization and death. So we found that generally the males, women, uh, men were surviving for more period than women. So that is biologically true that women are less susceptible to the disease. But once they are affected, their situation deteriorates faster than men. So biological, it is the biological reason behind the uh, higher death among women. More, males are more susceptible to get infected due to biological reason and also the, uh, the, the behavioral reason that people, men are more working and others. But biologically, female are more susceptible to death once they are infected. So it is biological. There is no social political issues. Okay. Uh, related to it, our next question is, uh, what are your views on immunity uh, along with Indian differences regarding immunity? Means uh, Delta, Delta variant? Yes. Well, um, it is controversial because mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I am not an immuno immunologist I, mm -hmm. or virologist in that sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not an epidemiologist, as you know. So, but Delta variant 
you know, um, I was, we are, we are going through the literature and I was talking to my colleagues who were working on, on the variants. Um, so one of our colleagues, he were, he was explaining why Delta variant is more, uh, like, uh, more effective in that sense that people are getting more infected. We can, um, uh, see the, in this way, like in 2019, when influenza become uh, uh, an epidemic in Mexico, that variant, influenza variant, was Mexican. So people, they had genetic potential to resist that variant, influenza variant. But um, people who were living in Mexico, having different genetical backgrounds, different uh, citizenship or different com country, different ethnic background in that sense, they got more affected and they died. But Mexicans, they could recover. In that sense, the Delta variant or any other like, like Gamma variant, it is coming from Latin America and you know, it is from Brazil. Brazil, it is in the Latin America, but remember that it was a colony of Portugal. So they are not genetically exactly similar to Mexicans. Uh, so the gamma variant and delta variants, these um, have these two variants have affected the Mexican populations huge because they are the foreign. These are the imported in that sense, imported variant. And genetically, and I think that my colleague was explaining probably the genetically we don't have that much of capacity to the Mexicans. They don't have uh, that much of capacity to resist this. Uh, you are saying you are you have origin from India. Probably you have. Uh, if you are affected with Delta variant, you will be cured. But we are not. He was just uh, uh, like gossiping, you know. So exactly, we don't know what happens. But Delta variant, it uh, spread. It, it, it has spread very fast, very fast in Mexico, and it caused huge number of death cases. But as I told that. We know this kind of variants like alpha, delta, gamma, but there are many other variants. These variants are the variants of concern. So out beyond this kind of four or five variants, there are other variants also. So we don't know how many uh, mutations are there and how many variants are there. But delta, of course, it is more effective. It was now it, there is, it is going down, but uh, for, from January to June, uh, Delta variant was highly prevalent uh, in, 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 in Mexico. Uh, the next question is uh, whether children below 12 years are really affected by third wave in Mexico as well as in India? Uh, well, I don't know about third wave mm -hmm. or second wave, but mm -hmm. uh, children, first of all, um, they are not going out of home. Of course, they are susceptible to get infected, um, but it's it needs a, a medical explanation that I don't have why the little children, they are not getting affected much. Um, of course, the parents, they are taking care of their um, children and um, uh, the, the, the COVID-19 cases, like the deaths of COVID-19 cases, uh, it shows the death cases also from the neonatal up to the 80, 90 and more than 90 years of age. But of course, the little children, the number of death cases were very much less and very few. Like pregnant women, the people are taking care of pregnant women. How many, uh, like 2% or 3% of pregnant women in a country, they are getting affected. And less than 1%, they are dying because the care they are receiving. In that sense, I think the children, they are receiving more care. That's why uh they are not getting affected but of course it's a behavioral issue that uh we the parents we must take care of our children we must take care of uh, the mothers particularly the pregnant mothers uh to restore and maintain the maternal capital uh, for future that's an interesting uh can you throw some light on research trends in epidemiological anthropology? Well, what is anthropology? Everything is anthropology. <laughs> See, uh, so uh, like human ecology, the papers which are published by our colleagues and the papers that I have published with my colleagues, I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not a uh, physician. I'm, I don't have any medical background. 
um, always I try to find something related to the, any kind of disease or any kind of health conditions related to the environment, related not only to the climate, but also the social and cultural environment, behavioral patterns. That's why my papers, which are published in the last year and also this year, um, I considered why males are more susceptible. It is not only for their immunological or the biological capital, but also their behavioral patterns. So this is anthropology. Because anthrop in anthropology, just like human ecology, we consider environment, we consider biocultural issues, we consider behavioral issues, we consider dietary habits, like lifestyle habits, everything. So the epidemiological uh, epidemiology of COVID-19, only giving comorbidities, only give, uh, giving data of death cases, only giving the confirmed cases, these, these are not these are the epidemiological data. Well, of course, these are very valuable, but what is then next, what is what next? So we have not only these important, the dashboard is not enough. We have to find, we have to, we, we must find out the roots. We have, why uh, this widespreading? Like in India, for example, we can, we, we shouldn't um, uh, put some stamp that this kind of reason, political or festive season, of course, these are not really the exact reason, but these have some effects. Um, uh, so, mainly the anthropological issues, I would say, the behavioral pattern, the social cultural aspects. So, um, uh, to prevent, if not cure, to prevent this pandemic. So, like uh, quarantine, the lockdown, the popular word lockdown, why? It is just to change, just to control the behavior of people. So. If we cannot control this disease in through medicine, through because doctors are there to treat, but unless we control ourselves, we maintain like we wash our hands, we put our hand sanitizer, put our mask, it is not possible. So it is the anthropology, it is the behavior, it is the environment, it is the social cultural issues related. So of course there are less number of anthropologists who are working and publishing papers on anthropology of COVID-19, but the human ecology and others like Barry Bogin and others, they published a paper on SEPE, like this kind of social, economic and political, emo emotional theories they are giving. It is very important. This is anthropological. Thank you. Uh, Thank do you. you have any data on the effectiveness of vaccination? No, not really. I, I think... Um, uh, no one can provide this kind of effectiveness, which vaccine is more uh, effective, which is not, right? So, uh, I think in, a, or in an official platform, we should not discuss with this kind of effectiveness of vaccine, which vaccine is more effective than others, <clears throat> because every vaccine um, no, it is was a, a product. Yeah. Excuse me, it was a general. I mean, how much yeah. of vaccination can save? That was oh, okay. The okay, okay, I understand. Yeah, of course. Well, vaccination is not the answer um, to cure the disease. We know it is just a protective shield. When in the winter we wear sweaters, that's all. So, vaccination is not the solution, but it is a protective measure. Just that if I get infected, my health situation will not be um, very critical because I have developed my my system has developed some uh, um, some preventive measures like after one month or one and a half months it is recommended to go for an antibody test why the antibody if it has developed antibody or not so many people after taking vaccines uh, they they went for this kind of test and some of them they they, they told that I, I I my antibody test I found no antibody has been developed so which vaccine you took X vaccine ah that is not good you take that one so we don't know the uh, effectiveness of any particular vaccine but of course vaccine we must go for vaccine it was because you know in Facebook and Twitter and many other social medias the idiotic some idiotic posts were there. So if you take the vaccine, your microchip will be there and the government will uh, control your movement. It is not true. So some people 
um, social media is evil, you know, so it's a greater evil. So not a laser one. So, uh, so uh, don't go for these rumors. Take the vaccine, insist, insist your near and dear ones to take the vaccine so that game may be protected. Uh, according to the uh, rules and regulations of the webinar committee of our college, only those questions are entertained uh, which has been posted in the chat box. So please uh, excuse us for the uh, those who have raised a hand. Uh, those their questions cannot be answered or put forward. Uh, I'll thank you, Shudip, for such an el elusive uh, and uh, a lucid presentation. I hand over the mic to Professor Monidipa Dr. Gupta. Thank you, uh -huh. Thank you very much, Joyita D, for conducting this session. Uh, well, we have almost come to the end of our webinar session. One thing just I would like to mention in this aspect is that today, that is 11 July, is also celebrated as the World Population Day throughout the world. And we are fortunate enough that Dr. Bonik has given us his valuable time to organize this webinar. And our students also prepared an audiovisual presentation on today's theme, which has already been uploaded in the YouTube. And we Excellent. will share the link after this webinar. Now I would uh, request our IQSC coordinator, sir, Dr. Kuntal Chattopadhyay, to deliver the vote of thanks. One query, Monidipa, uh, is this session has been recorded, the video? Yes, yes, it has been recorded. Uh, ah, yes, it you. has been recorded. Uh, and I shall be very happy to receive the link of this video so that I can um, show my colleagues here. Okay, okay. So that Thank we you. shall talk with the college authority Thank and you. definitely we'll make an arrangement. Thank you so much. And sir, uh, now I would uh, like to request Dr. Kuntal Chattopadhyay, sir, to deliver the, the vote of thanks. Thank you, Monidipa, madam. I believe I am audible to you. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Thank you. So, it's my pleasure to move this vote of thanks today. Uh, first of all, my sincerest thanks to our respected speaker, Dr. Dr. Bonik for his really very engrossing deliberation. He has explored so many well-researched, thought-provoking issues. We are really greatly benefiting. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Sincerest thanks also to our respected principal, madam, who is always there encouraging us, supporting us. Thanks to the Department of Anthropology for organizing this very enlightening webinar in collaboration with the IQSC of the college. Thanks to all the honorable members of the IQSC. Thanks to the members of our technical team who have lent a lot of support. And finally, thanks to all the participants of this webinar. Thank you all. I would now request our principal, Madam, to conclude this session with our final remarks. Welcome, Madam. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. We are really delighted to have such a nice presentation and also enlightened a lot. And uh, this is really a very, very rare opportunity for us and uh, our students also to have this kind of uh, data and this kind of research which is very much relevant in this pandemic situation. And I would like to thank all my colleagues and my dear students for their patient hearing. And uh, now uh, I would like to conclude the session with a few words that uh, we have really celebrated this uh, World Population Day with a fantastic academic endeavor for the whole day. In the morning, we have started our day with a fantastic uh, audiovisual presentation prepared by our students and in the evening we have an opportunity to listen a very good lecture, very enlightening uh, speech and presentation from an <coughs> eminent speaker and uh, professor. 
so thank you all and now i declare the session uh, at is, as it is concluded and uh, thank you all again and good night thank you very thank much thank you madam thank you very much see you again bye thank you